So the title of my message, actually, we're just going to be preaching on, so I'm going to be preaching, not we, I will be preaching on Psalm 127. And I know it's only five verses, but there's a lot that we can glean from in that uh, psalm. I was just, I'm finishing up the Psalms recently. You know, I, I jump around in my Bible reading so that, you know, I, I just get different portions of Scripture all the time. And right now I happen to be in the Psalms. You know, I'll go through several chapters in the Old and then in the Middle and then go to the New Testament and jump around. But Psalm 127 just stood out to me this time. And it's for several reasons. And, you know, we're going to go through that here in the message. But the very first thing that I want to point out is, uh, and while we're doing that, let's go to, uh, let's go there to Matthew 7, just to kind of give you an example of what I'm going to be talking about. But the first thing I'm just going to focus on it while you guys are turning there to Matthew 7, uh, and it's going to be verse 24, is that the Bible tells us there, except the Lord build the house. And so we're, what we see there is, except the Lord build the house. In other words, there is no other way to build any foundation for anything that we do unless it's through the Lord. And the reason that I'm focused on that is because the challenge that we're dealing with today is that most people want to separate. The first thing I want to point out is that most people want to separate out that, like their lives. And you know, you've heard me say this before, but it is something that is constantly preached in the world is, you know, God first, business second, or family second, business third, or some variation of that. But the reality is that except the Lord built the house, we labor in vain. And I'm talking about any aspect of our life, God should be the most dominant force. You know, he should be the foundation for anything that we do, whether it's, uh, you know, getting up in the morning and just dealing with our families, going to work and dealing with our bosses or our businesses. And then, of course, dealing with our brothers and sisters in Christ here at church. And if you look at Matthew 7, 24, we're just gonna, I just want to show you, like a, it's, I don't know if you necessarily consider it a parallel passage, but it's, a, it's the same message said in, in another form. And you know, one of the great things about the Bible is the Bible is very repetitive. And they say that repetition is the mother of learning, and it's the father of skill, and the grandfather of character, or something along those lines. There's different ways of people saying that. But the one thing is, we have to be very repetitive. There's not a lot of variation in the basic principles of life and the foundational, uh, fundamental things that we do in life. You know, it's really just doing the little things every day and getting really good at them, right? Most people get really good at living the world every day and then they just neglect God. We should do the opposite, right? God should be our dominant force. We should get really good at reading our Bible in the morning and the evening. We should get good at our prayer life. We should get good at not missing church. And then we add everything else onto there from that foundation. But let's go to Matthew 7. Now let's start there at verse 24. And it said, uh, he says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught, he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. And what's interesting is a couple of things you, you see here is, the first thing he says is, there support whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built. So it's not just hearing the word, but it's doing the word. You know, the pastor just alluded to that this morning, Pastor Cobb, in his morning message about doing the work, the work of the Lord. And if you know to do good and you don't do it, it is sin, right? And then the other thing right there at verse uh, 28, it says, and it came to pass when Jesus had ended the, these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. And, and in an interesting, the more simple we keep Bible principles, the more people are shocked. You know, one of the, the things that astonishes people the most is when you're preaching the Word of God. And as a matter of fact, Eli had that uh, example last week when he was uh, soul winning. Uh, he he met a couple, and uh, they were he. Had, it was the last couple of the evening uh, yet last uh, last week, and what. The one thing that stood out to me was not so much the interaction, but that they were shocked that all you had to do was believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, the, the young lady kept saying, no, I agree with you, but 
you gotta do all these things. I mean, and it just went back and forth and back and forth. The funny thing about it all was, it's so true that people just get astonished at the simplicity of salvation, and then what comes afterwards, right? I mean, really, if you just stand on God's word, it's not that difficult. It's difficult when the world attacks, but I mean, it's not that difficult to follow God's commandments. It's not easy, but it is simple. And the challenge is people get astonished all the time when we preach the way that we do, or we say the certain uh, things that we do, or the doctrines. And you look at that right there, it says, the people were astonished at his doctrine. What's one of the things that people that are independent, fundamental Baptists get is sometimes they attack what? The doctrine that we preach, right? Because we preach hard doctrines, and they think that we go about it wrong. As a matter of fact, when Pastor Logan Robinson got kicked out, you know, one of the funny things that stood out to me in, in Australia was that they kept saying that he wasn't associated with the Baptist of New Zealand or the New Zealand Baptist Conference or whatever. They, they were astonished at his doctrine. They didn't want to have anything to do with him. So even though they had the name Baptist attached to them, they weren't preaching Baptist principles, right? And it, it, what's interesting is if you look at the Bible, because this is about foundational building, right? This is how everything gets built. I mean, Psalm 127 says, except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain to build it. And one of the things that I was looking up is I wanted to look up the word fundamental, and you don't find that in the Bible because of, really it's interchangeable with the word foundation. But we are fundamental in our beliefs. We're fundamental in what we do for the Lord. And let's look at, before we get into the, the, the gist of the message, let's look at a couple of things. It says there, except the Lord built the house, they labor in vain that built it. And so you just look up that word vain, and vanity is empty or worthless or fruitless. And so the challenge is that the world, they're just doing things without any purpose, right? It's empty, and that's why when people say, oh, I feel so alone or so empty in what I'm doing, I just feel like I'm going through the motions. The world has done a good job. Satan has done a marvelous job at convincing everybody that we have to go through the motions. You know, we just go to the day-to-day. -day. Have you ever uh, driven down I-10 at like six o'clock in the morning and you just look to your right or to your left, you look at the people driving to work, and what are they? They look empty because they're just going through the motions. You know, they they they, they just got out of work the night before. They probably were there late. Because that's a very common thing here in in uh, in, uh, in Houston. You know, it, even if you get out at five, you're going to get home at eight, depending on where you live and the traffic and the things you got to deal with. And, and what it is is this: they just they get to the point where they're like drones. They're worthless. You know, it's fruitless. They don't feel like they're getting anything accomplished in life. That's why we have such terms like midlife crisis. And you get these 50-year-old guys who go buy motorcycles or get divorced and try to date younger women, do all these things because they, they don't feel like there's anything that's fulfilling them. It's the vanity of the world that draws you, but then it's the vanity of the world that makes you uh, feel like there's nothing to live for. It's hopeless. That's why suicide is up. You know, that's why divorce is up. That's why all these things that... If you think about it, think about how we've been conditioned our life. If you're a product of the public school system, which I was and I'm not, you know, I went to private school, but I also went to public schools. The first thing they do is from the very time that you start going from, and now, you know, when I was back in the 80s, there was no pre-K. I think it, it, they had just started in, uh, implementing pre-K in, into the schools. I remember my parents couldn't send me to school when we moved here to the U.S. from Mexico. Uh, my first interaction in the public school system was kindergarten. Well, what's, the, what's the thing that they start doing? They start conditioning you to live this drone, fruitless, purposeless life, right? The bell rings and you go to school. The bell rings and you eat lunch. The bell rings and you're done with lunch. You know, and then you go through the end of the day and the bell rings and you're done with, uh, with school and then you go home and guess what? You turn on the TV and the commercial starts and it's telling you the new show. 20 minutes later, the show's done. I mean, everything is kind of time for you, and you just move from one little thing to another little thing. You don't accomplish much, but you're doing things. It's all just busy work. It's just kind of like one thing, the bell rings, then it's the next thing, and the bell rings, and it's the next thing. And I mean, it's not, sometimes it's a literal bell, but other times it's whatever the news is uh, conditioning to, everything's done in 20 minutes lots, or 45 minutes lots, 
uh, movies are two hours long, you know, sitcoms are about 20 minutes long, miniseries are 45 minutes long. If you study the way that media does this, it's to condition you, and they know what your attention span is. As a matter of fact, that's why these uh, preachers that preach for more than 30 minutes, sometimes you start to see yawns in the audience and, and rolling off things because our attention span, uh, span has been changed. We have to unbrainwash ourselves and undo the things of the world in order to be able to even sit through a good, like, long sermon. You know, back in the day, if you read the history, people would go to church all day. As a matter of fact, even in the Bible, some guy fell asleep and fell dead because Paul preached for so long, right? We're not going to go into that, but... That's what happens, but that's, if you think about it, busy work makes it for fruitless, vain, it's worthless, right? And what's the other thing that they've been pushing for so long is, and you're not going to see this work here, but I looked it up anyways, because one of the things I was doing was I, I just kind of did a study on, you know, how long the, the world's been brainwashing us. You know, there's a magazine out there called Vanity Fair. Think about the name, Fruitless Fair, Worthless Fair, you know, uh, just Empty Fair. This is a magazine that's telling you that you should follow it so that you know how to be worthless and how to be fruitless and how to be empty. And then there's another magazine that's real popular. It's called Cosmopolitan. And if you look up that word, that word means world citizen. It's someone who fits in anywhere. And th if you think about that doctrine, because it is a doctrine versus what we preach, right? That we're separate from the world. We don't fit in anywhere. As a matter of fact, we don't even fit in most places. And why? Because the Lord built that house, right? But if you labor in vain, you're just going to win a doctrine. You don't stand for something, you're going to fall for anything. You've heard that saying. What ends up happening is your fruitless, empty labor makes you follow and fall into anything. And if you think about it, that's why they've trained us, right? So you finish high school. You know, you go through elementary, the bell rings. You go through junior high and the bell rings. You go through high school and the bell rings. That's why I'm for homeschooling because there's no bell ring. you got to get the job done, right? Then you can go do something. You know, I, I used to get away with so much. I'd be like, Mom, let me just watch this one show, and then I'll do my homework. And that one show turned into another show, and another, you know, and you just never get it done. And then school is so easy in the public school system because it's all just about multiple confusion. You just got to figure out the system, and you can answer most questions. But then what happens is, what, what's the next step? You, you graduate from high school, what do you have to do? You go to college. And when you go to college, what do you have to then do? You get married. You have 2.5 children, and you get a house, and you got to find a job, not just any job. You got to have benefits, and you got to have 401ks or IRAs, and then you got to make sure that you, you work there long enough to retire, and then you retire, you travel the world, and then you die. I mean, think about how fruitless, how vain, how empty that is, right? But that's the world. That's what the world teaches. So whenever they meet someone like us, they don't understand how we believe that we're just going to preach or go to church or door knock till the day we die. You know, we don't, I don't believe in retirement. I don't know where, why retirement should exist other than if someone is retired from a job, but they're out there doing the ministry and the work of the Lord, that's okay. You know, that's different. But most people retire onto a golf course, right? And then they, what happens, have you ever read the statistics on people that retire and they don't know what to do with their time? You know, all of a sudden they start getting Alzheimer's and their uh, mental ability diminishes and they're, they're not able to talk as well and uh, get along as well. And the next thing you know, they just die. I mean, think about how sad that is. But that's society. I'm not actually talking on the uh, exception. I'm talking on what's the norm. Most of the world lives like this. And then the other thing that, that society has done, you know, with technology is now you've gone through the motions. Everybody does the same thing. And now you can fit in anywhere. You can become a world citizen. As long as you don't have a moral stance, you can live in the US or you can get a job in Europe. As a matter of fact, Europe's even worse. I mean, those guys don't work at all. They have like one month to two months off. It's part of like their whole package. I mean, I think I saw some stupid article about how the US is the only country in the world that doesn't give uh, you know, uh, maternity leave to men. I I didn't have a baby. I don't know what maternity leave I need. I mean, I need a maternity leave is I need to leave when my wife has a child to go work and provide for my family. But you know, and they make it like a negative thing. And and I'm gonna pull up some, uh, you know, I, I pulled up some stuff here about what's going on. But let's look at the uh, let's focus and let's go to Proverbs 12:11 here. Go to Proverbs 12. Proverbs 12:11. I'm just gonna point out a couple of verses that speak on the vanity. And, and you know just the emptiness and the worthlessness of the world and then I'm going to uh, 
we'll, we'll move into the, the points of the message. But go to Proverbs 12, verse 11. And it says, He that tilleth his land shall be satisfied with bread. But he that followeth vain persons is void of understanding. So in other words, in order to get understanding, we have to be have the ability and the willingness to work. It's not just read your Bible, it's do the work. And not just uh, the ministry work, because we have to live. The challenge is most people want to live for material things, not just to provide for their home, you know, put food on the table, a roof over your head, and then the rest of the time you spend on the Lord. Most people want to work, and then buy the nicer car, and then buy the nicer home, and then the next latest gadget, an iPhone 25 is coming out, and you still have 23. I mean, what a loser. You, you can't keep up with it. I mean, that's really the mentality of the world, right? And uh, if you look there, um, well, actually, this is the point I want to make, because somebody posted on Facebook, or and uh, I think it was, uh, Eli or Laura, they posted about how here in, and I don't know if it's in Houston or if it's just in the, in the entire country, I probably think it's in the entire country, there's a lack of laborers. We don't have people that want to get their hands dirty, and there's great jobs out there, but nobody wants to get them. Because everybody wants to go to college, and then from college get a desk job. You know, nobody's willing to get their hands dirty, and what's happening to our economy is that we have a good economy, there's actually jobs out there that people could get, but they're too beneath them because you actually have to, you know, put some, you know, sweat and grease and all blood and sweat and toil into it. Everybody wants to just sit behind a computer. And I mean, if you have a job and you sit behind a computer, as long as you're doing a, a purposeful, purposeful job, that's fine. But most people just want to clock in and clock out, you know, and so it gives you that fruitless vain result, right? And so let's let's see what the Lord wants us to build. Let's look at what the Lord tells us to build. But before that, go to Matthew 15. Matthew 15. Matthew 15, we're going to be in verses 1 through 9. So turn your Bibles over to Matthew 15. It says, Then, then came Jesus, then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandments, I mean the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and thy mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die a heathen. Let him die the death, I'm sorry. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. And honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus ye have made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, say, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they do worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And the point I want to make here before we go into the the uh, the rest of the Psalms is that that's what we have a tendency to do when there's vain and fruitless things is we'll twist the word of God to fit our mentality. So, you know, that's obviously, if you look at uh, uh, verses right there where, they, where he says in verse, uh, verse five, he says, but ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift, but whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Obviously, that's not God's word. But that's what the scribes were teaching. You know, that's what the Pharisees were teaching. They took God's word, which said, honor thy father and thy mother, and they changed it to mean whatever they wanted it to mean. And, you know, you go today, and you look at society, and the first thing that they're telling you is don't get married. Cohabitate, but, you know, Try it out first before you get married. And the reason I'm saying this up is because the Bible, this specific psalm is speaking about children and building your house. And though is the heritage of, you know, children are heritage of the Lord, right? And we're going to go into those verses, but that's what the world has done. You know, you can go into any good uh, contemporary church and they're going to be promoting the things of the world. You know, they're going to be promoting divorce. They're going to be promoting uh, 2.5 children. They're going to be promoting uh, jobs and the career of a woman versus a man. And you know that women can preach as good as men and that it's the equality of all and that God and Jesus would never kick out a sodomite and all these things. 
And we know that not to be true. The Bible is very specific about that, right? And so let's go to Proverbs 17, 6. And we're going to look at this. And so in Psalm 127, verse 2, it says, It is vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. And then verse 3 through 5 is going to be talking about children, right? It says, Lo, children are an heritage or an inheritance of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. And the challenge is that our country is not being rewarded because we're not willing to have children. And the children that we do have, we're willing to murder. And if we're not willing to murder them, we'll have them outside of the womb. And then what we're going to do to those children is we're just going to throw them into a system that has no, that requires no responsibility of us. As long as we don't have that burden, as long as we don't have to deal with them, it's okay. And that's really what's going on here. Go to Proverbs 17, uh, verse number 6. Proverbs 17, number 6. But the Bible tells us different, right? The Bible specifically tells us, it says, Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. Well, you can't have that if you're not having children. You know, one of the most exciting things about this church and churches like ours is they have a lot of children. You know, and they're willing to expand and grow their families. And, and the other thing is that, you know, there are exceptions. Here's the challenge. There are exceptions to the rule. And most uh, most people might not preach on that. There's, there's families that just might not have children. Or there's people that aren't meant to get married. But that's an exception. The challenge is that the world, most of your religions will preach on the exception, but not on the norm, right? It's so funny. If, if, you're, if you believe wrong, you're the exception. And the world says, it's normal to just go with any anything. Let's be cosmopolitan. Let's be world citizens. If they kill babies, we'll just turn a blind eye, even if I don't agree, as long as they don't kill my babies, it's okay. Well, you're killing some baby. You know, you're, t you're snuffing out some life, as the pastor said earlier today. Go to Proverbs 31, verse 28. What does the Bible tell us in Proverbs 31? Verse 28, Proverbs 31, verse 28, it says, Her children, and this is talking of the virtuous woman, it says, Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. So how does a woman have virtue? She has children that she watches over and they call her blessed. And then her husband uh, is able to praise her. Well, if you're not having children, if you're getting married so you can travel the world and each, everybody has a career, how do you get that blessing? You don't. You know, you're not going to get the blessings of God if you're not willing to do what God has asked you to do. Go to Psalm 128. Let's go back to Psalms. Just the next Psalm over. We're just going to focus on verses 3 and 6. And it says... And by the way, just keep your, your finger there on Psalm 127 because we're going to go back to it and that's where we're going to close out. Just I should have said that earlier. But Psalm uh, 128 verses 3 says, Thy wife shall be as, as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children, like olive plants, round about the table. And then go down to verse 6 and it says, Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children and peace upon Israel. So the Bible talks about the blessings of children. Versus not having children. And let's just go down to Genesis 20, verse 17. And I know that was real deep theological stuff, but I mean, it's that simple. Either do what the Lord says and you're fruitful, multiply, or you don't. Go down to uh, Genesis 20, Genesis 20, verses 17 through 18. Genesis 20, verses 17 through 18. It says, So Abraham prayed unto God. And this is after Abraham had gone in to one of the nations and uh, Abimelech, uh, he had told them that Sarah was his sister. And of course, God calls him out. And this is towards the end. And it says, so Abraham prayed unto God and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants and they bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. And so what had happened you guys know the story. Abraham goes in the city. He's afraid because his wife's beautiful. So he says, just say you're my sister. Abimelech takes to her and he wants to be with her. And God says, no, you know, this is the wife of Abraham. And then Abimelech actually gets mad at Abraham. And I'm going through this really quick. And then at the end, what happened? God had already closed the womb of that nation. And he opened it up. You know, where does... The children, where does this life come from? God. And I want to make, the reason I'm going through these points is because I want to make a, a, a specific uh, focus on the fact that God wants us to grow uh, our churches, grow our homes, grow our ministry through children. 
You know, he says, except the Lord build the house. And what house is he building? A house of fruitfulness, of multiplication. See, if you're vain, you're empty. There's no fruit. But if you're doing what the Lord has asked you to do, you're going to be fruitful and you're going to multiply. And it's funny, even when we go out soul winning, right, it's a compound effect. If we get two soul winners out there, we might get good numbers. But if we get two, three hundred soul winners, it's not going to be the same. Like, it, let's say Eli and I go soul winning and, and on average, we average five souls a month. I don't know. Something like that. And we do this for a whole year. You know, we're going to get... But what's interesting, and, and don't ask me how that works, that's just the law of large numbers. That's how God created this mathematical equation and, and the beauty of the power of compound, compounding, right? If all of a sudden we get groups of twos, and let's just say it's only five groups of two, and they average five, somewhere along the line, that number is just going to take off. I don't know what it is or how it works, or maybe we have more zeal or we rub off on each other, but eventually maybe we average five, but then there's, a, there's this... There's, there'll be times in that soul winning group because it's just bigger that we won't do 25 souls one. We'll do 30 or 50 or 60. It just compounds. And it's, I don't know how that works, but just do that with anything, right? If you go out there and you're gonna move your house and it's just one person, and, you know, it could take you like five hours. And you say, oh, well then if it's, let's say, let's say you're moving a house. You're gonna move from one home to another and it's just one person. You say, oh, it's gonna take me 10 hours to get all this moving done. The same thing happens, like if now you add one person to it, it's not going to be five hours, you know, ten, cut down two. It could be all of three hours. That's compounded. So we've got to go out there and be fruitful and multiply. That's what God's telling us because we're, our efforts will be compounded. We'll be able to do much more for the Lord. It's better, like the Bible says, right, it's better to have two than one because if you're alone, nobody's there to lift you up. And I'm paraphrasing that. But here's what's happened. Because the reason I'm focusing on the children is because Psalms 127 focuses on the children, right? Is that what's the enemy, number one, outside of Jesus? Of course, we know Satan hates God. I mean, that's evident throughout the entire Bible. And I'm not preaching on Satan right now. But we know that enemy number one is God. It was Jesus. It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. He hates them. I mean, as a matter of fact, some of these stupid doctors that we hear about oneness and about you know one God and all this stuff, that's an attack on Jesus uh, himself, on the Holy Spirit, on God Almighty. But what happens is, you know, think about how we've changed the narrative because Satan's number one enemy besides God is children. If you look at the evil in this world, what's the thing that we attack the most? The weakest, either through abortion or uh, murdering, because that's really what we should call it, right? Yep. Through medication through the public school system, through brainwashing, through indoctrination, now through child abuse, from you know sodomy to acceptance of transgenderism and all kinds of genders, and it's not man and it's not women. Talk, think about what it does to a child when you confuse them like that. Yeah. You know, think about what you're doing when you're planting the seed, that it's not just a boy and a girl, but it could be a boy who thinks he's a girl or a girl who thinks they're a boy or whatnot, right? And then now, you know, is it okay for a, an adult to love a little child and a child to love a, an adult back? You know, that's the attack. It's just constant attack on the weak. Why? Because that's the easiest attack. If somebody came and tried to tell me that transgenderism was good, come on. I mean, I'm grounded in the word. You're an idiot. And then we'll just go toe to toe. But you tell a little five-year-old that transgenderism is normal, and if they, their parents aren't with them, that's why I don't believe in the Santa school system. They're going to be confused. And unless somebody's there to back them up and give them that, that strength and that boldness, they're not going to know what to do at five years old. Yep. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you became the greatest preacher in America or in the world. When you were five years old, you were weak and you were vulnerable. Yeah. Right? And, but what, why, has this message been, why has this message been laid on my heart? Because there's an attack on the foundations of God. Right? 20 years ago, and I don't know the names. I didn't pull them up. But I've actually heard hard sermons on sodomites. One, one preacher comes to mind specific. I wish I would have gotten his name. But I, I remember listening to the sermon, and he was like, kill a queer day and all kinds of stuff. And then 20 years later, somebody played that sermon, and then he came out with like a public service announcement where he said, look, what I preached 20 years ago was not what I believe now. And he's very apologetic, and you know we have to be loving to the sodomite, and loving to the uh, to the world, and to the you know all the wickedness and everything. And then you you hear things like, well, you know, it's okay. Let's just as long as he's saved by grace, that's fine. 
Well, you know what? I don't think that that is the, the truth because when you're causing confusion in the congregation, you're losing souls to hell. Stop being so selfish just because you are saved and you're not grounded in the word doesn't make it right for you to go out there and preach incorrect stuff. That's why preaching is so serious to me because if you're not going to preach the word of God, then don't get up and do it. Because what you're doing is you're creating confusion. God says he's not the author of confusion, right? If you look, you know, you got stuff like these idiots that are preaching like, oh, well, flat earth or end times pre rapture You say, well, what's wrong if these guys are preaching this stuff if they're safe? You know, actually, I don't know uh, if you wanted to nitpick one-on-one, -on -one, but in a general sense, it's wrong because once we start accepting stupidity, it's not that hard to accept something like pedophilia. You know, there's actual articles that I've been pushing, and I've been watching this all year, where they're trying to normalize these pedophiles. Yep. And who do pedophiles go after? Kids. Children. And the Bible says, except the Lord built the house, they labor in vain in Psalm 127, right? And it says, lo, the children are a heritage of the Lord. I don't think it's a coincidence that he put verse 1, and then three verses later, two verses later, he's talking about children. The foundation is the children, but if we're going to attack the children, then we're going to ruin that foundation. And it's going to be vain, and it's going to be fruitless, and it's going to be empty. So let's give you the literal application of Psalm 127. The literal application of one, Psalm 127. It's easy, right? God's telling us that he wants us to build families. You know, he created the three institutions, right? Family, church, and the government. But the one that he's talking about here, and the one that he built first was the family. You know, go to, go to Genesis 1, 27 through 28. Let's just, let's just go to the very first very first chapter in the Bible. Let's keep this uh, real simple. Verse 27 through 8 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And the, the couple of things stand out here. The very first thing you see is he wants us to have a family. Second of all, just let's just uh, attack it because uh, it, I've seen it a lot lately. If you guys think I'm out of line, you can come up to me afterwards. But I don't think I'm out of line. As a matter of fact, I, I think that they're going to ramp it up in the next six months. This this push for pedophilia to be accepted as normal, it's going to be something that we're going to have to deal with and we're going to have to protect our children. Yep. This is a serious thing. Just do your research. You tell me, but think about Genesis 127. What do you say God created them? He, uh, uh, let's go to 27. Let me not butcher that. God, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female. Now, did he create a male adult and a female child? No, he created them male and female adults. We know that. Because then they had children. So if God wanted us to even consider this, he would have set it up from the beginning. Amen. Right? If he wants to have this foundation, we would have had this from the beginning, but that's not so. As a matter of fact, isn't it interesting that we're preaching on this? And that's what uh, Pastor Robertson got kicked out for because he called Muhammad a pedophile. Yep. You know? So the world's okay with pedophilia, and I was preaching the word of God. Yep. That didn't even make any sense. But, you know, and I know I've, I've been preaching, but I mean, it's just really just... I mean, I'm just fired up about that. Just listen, let me calm down a little bit. But then you got, so when you have a marriage, what do you, what's the next natural thing? Kids. But not just 2.5 kids. See, the world wants you to have kids, like, for an Instagram pic or a Facebook post. You know, you have your two kids, you go to, no, the Bible says just be fruitful and multiply. Well, you, you know, one times one is one, and two times one is two. The only way you get multiplication is, Two times two is four, four times two is eight, and I'm not, I'm not that great at math, so we'll stop right there. But what I'm saying is you've got to multiply. You've got to have multiple children, multiple church members, multiple churches, multiple congregations, whatever you want to talk about, but God gave us that commandment. And you know, I have an article here from, to, from June 30th, so a month ago, and actually, if you look up on the news sites, there's a, a newer article, I just didn't have time to print it, about how you know, the U.S. fertility rate just hit a historic low. It says why some demographers are freaking out. And I'm not going to read this to you. But basically what it's saying is that we're not having enough children. We're actually in a state of attrition. You know, we're, we're we don't have enough people right now to sustain the next generation. 
You know, and I remember when I was in, in the financial services, one of the big things we would, uh, when we were trying to get these baby boomers to invest their money, is we're like, look, you need to invest your money because there's not enough of your children to, they're putting money into social security to sustain uh, the next generation and the generation after. So if you don't leave something for your kids, they're not gonna have anything to live on. Now, of course, I don't care if I get social security, we know the Lord's gonna provide, but the point was being made that we just don't have enough people being born in this world. But if you look at the false religions, man, they're having kids like crazy. Just go to a Mormon uh, religion or, you know, even the, the Muslims. But us as Christians, we're afraid to do it for all the stupid reasons. Oh, well, the rapture and the world's the best place. And, you know, how can we raise kids in this bad place? Or, you know, the burden. You know, people shouldn't have a lot of kids if they didn't plan it out. How can, that's, that's messed up that you have a lot of kids and you can't provide for them. So God can't provide for your children. He doesn't have the ability to put food on the table. But what did he say in the New Testament, right? He knows what our needs are. And that's the kind of mentality we've been planting in people's heads for such a long time. Once you get past that, you can just throw anything their way. You know, going back, and, and I got ahead of myself, but here I have a just a short article. The editor of Cosmopolitan Magazine, the reason I picked on that is, uh, was Helen Gurley Brown. And you can look her up. But she was a prostitute at one point in her life. She was in an escort service. And if, you've, if you know anything of Cosmopolitan, and, and you don't go pick one up. You don't need to. I can tell you right now. Every article is about being with somebody else outside of marriage. It's about fornication, it's about adultery, and it's about not having kids. It's a career-minded, independent, promiscuous woman. That's what Cosmopolitan does. So they're just trying to destroy the family. God's foundation, which is the literal foundation he's given us here, is children, they've been destroying for a long time. You know, Cosmic Politics has been around since like the 60s or 70s. It's not something new. I mean, it's been around for a long time, so it's Vanity Fair. Think about how long they've been indoctrinating the children, the men and women of America for years, for years. And then we wonder why these things are happening. And then, of course, you know, I'm not gonna repeat myself, but if you have a marriage and you have kids, what comes next is grandkids. You know, we just had my daughter's Two year, uh, two year old birthday party, and the grandparents were here. And I mean, I mean, you would think we. I love my kids, but I don't know, man. They're competing. And they're showering her with love and gifts, and she gets away with everything. But that's because that's that's their reward for having children, right? Is now we have children, and, th and they get to see that it comes full circle. You know, they've seen their children grow up, and they've raised them, and now they get to see their grandchildren. The Bible says that that's that's something special. I don't know. I hope that one day I get to see my grandchildren. Because if my parents are like that, I hope I'm the way, same way. I mean, they just, they're like, they're like, no, I mean, my dad was hard when we were growing up. And he's like a big softie around my daughter and my son. He's like, anything they want. Now, dad's there to put some discipline in there, but it's a big fight. Go to uh, Hebrews 13, 4. The Bible specifically tells us not only to be fruitful and multiply and have uh, our children, but it wants us to do it in the context of marriage. You know, the Bible just tells us there in Hebrews 13, Verse 4, Hebrews 13, verse 4 says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So the world is being judged. You know, John 3, 18 says, For they're condemned already. Right? Everybody loves 16 and 17. They just don't preach seven, uh, 18. So the literal application is God's telling us, Look, build a family. He's telling us, Build a family. Have children. And, and you know what, if you, I don't know every situation, and if, if that's something that you're struggling with, you know, pray to the Lord, take it to the Lord, you and your husband and your wife, and, and get together. But the one thing that I hate is the people that can't have children or are against it, then they're real negative about it. I remember, I, I never experienced this because I had children later in life, you know, and now I want a bunch of them. But anyways, that's a, another story for another. But one of the things that, that really annoyed me when we were first, uh, when Mary Sarah was first pregnant with uh, our, uh, our daughter is that, People were like, well, get ready. Get ready, because it's going to be real tough. Oh, man. Just wait. Just wait. Like, why you got to be so mean? I mean, they're just trying to... And then you say something like, oh, I want to have... I want to have multiple children. You think you can handle that? <laughs> well, I mean, just... That's a lot. And it's like, oh, and they're... Bur you just enjoy your single life, because you're never going to go out again. That's it. It's over. Your life is you know, of course my life as I know it is over. I'm having children. 
It's my new life, right? It's something that I'm looking forward to, Amen. right? I'm ready for the challenge. I want the children. Why is that such a negative thing? Amen. Oh no, you know, he, you you thought you you could go out, man. You won't be able to do anything anymore. You never have time for yourself. Well, I mean, who cares, right? But it's so negative, you know. And I'm sick and tired of those people. And you, and it didn't. I mean, my wife and I. We've been married and we're both we both got married in Christ, right? What I'm saying is I didn't get married and get saved. I was saved. My, my my wife was saved at three years old. We were both Christians when we had our child. And these are Christian people in our lives telling us this stuff. Oh no, are you sure you want to have children? Are you ready? Uh, look, I wish I would have had them when I got married at 31. You know, I think I waited too long. Because now I want to have like 20, but I'm probably going to get, you know, maybe less than 20. I don't know. I'm not going to say maybe I can get 19. But the, the point of the matter is, why do you have to be negative? When people ask me for advice, I tell them the truth. You know, these are the things you're going to experience. But kids are a joy. And even the tough times are a joy. You learn so much. You're able to do so much. And the Bible says there, you know, in, in Psalm 127, they labor in vain. You know what? When I work for my children, when I work for the church, when I work for the Lord, it's not in vain. And I, God gives me more energy. God gives me more ability. You know, you put kids out in your life, and all of a sudden you really got to get to work. See, that's why society doesn't understand what it is to be committed to anything. Because people get married and don't have kids, and they think that they're like, you ever meet those, the the uh, the, the sitting in the stand parents? Sorry for my lack of good English, but the sitting in the stand parents, you know, they, they're just real good parents from afar. Well, I would never let my child do that. And I would Blah, blah, blah. And what ends up happening, though, is that they're people of influence. They discourage others from having children. You know, my uh, my sister is getting married uh, at the end of this year. And I've heard her say, I hope, I pray that she has children. But I've heard her say that she doesn't want to have children. And I know why she doesn't want to have children. Because she's hung around with all the bad influence on my dad's side of the family. A bunch of sodomites, no good for nothings. You know, just living for the world, feminist, no good for anything. And they convince you. That's the influence you have. And some people are more susceptible than others. That's why we need to be grounded in the Lord. Now let's look, and let's close out with this. Let's look at the spiritual application that God has for us. And then uh, and I'll give you one more article that really gets my go. But let's look at the uh, spiritual application. Is that God, the first thing we've got to look at, go to Galatians 3, verse 26. Go to Galatians 3, verse 26. Galatians 3, verse 26. It says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Let's read verse 27. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So the Bible is telling us that we are his children. So God is consistent in his message. In Psalm 127, we are his children. So he, he, he's not contradicting his foundation. It says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. And then what is the house that he's building? Children. He's being fruitful and he's multiplying. And spiritually, when Jesus died on that cross, and those that have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, we are now children of Christ. We That's why we call each other brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so because we are engrafted into Jesus Christ. We are part of the same family. We're washed in that blood, right? The Bible then tells, then what's the other type of children, spiritual children we have? When we have spiritual children, we go soul winning and we lead those individuals to Christ, they become our spiritual children, right? And maybe even our spiritual grandchildren and somebody else leads them to Christ, right? Go to uh, 1 Timothy 1, verse 12. 1 Timothy 1, verse 12. And I'll, I'll prove it to you with the Bible. That way, that way we, we stay consistent. 1 Timothy 1, <clears throat> chapter 1, verse 12, sorry. 1 Timothy 1, chapter 1, verse 12. Obviously, there's more than one chapter. And I mean, I'm sorry, verse 2. Verse 2, sorry, not 12. I, my handwriting is horrible. It says, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. Obviously, we know, if you've studied the Bible, that Paul did not have Timothy. That's not his biological son. Paul did not have a wife that had Timothy, right? Um, what I'm saying is, Paul did not have Timothy. Let's make that very clear. Amen. That is his spiritual son that he raised in the faith. 
So whenever we lead others to Christ and then we disciple them and help them grow in the faith, those are our spiritual children. You know, let's go to Philemon. And it's after Titus, go to Philemon. Uh, Philemon, one, uh, Philemon 1, verse 10. Go to Philemon. It's a little tiny book. Philemon 1, verse 10. And again, we see that it says, I beseech you thee, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, who might have begotten in my bonds. Again, that's not his biological son, right? That's not his child, that's his spiritual child. So the Bible is applying this, you know, we have children, we have, we're, first of all, the only way to do that is we've got to become his child, God's children, right? And then we go soul winning and we create spiritual children. And then what do we want to do? We want to disciple them. Go to Acts 14, go to Acts 14. Verses 19 through 23, Acts 14. Verses 19 through 23. And it says in verse 19, it says, And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up, and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra, to Iconum, and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples, and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church, and had prayed with fasting, they commanded them to the Lord, on whom they believed. So a couple of things we see here is obviously they're going around discipling those spiritual children and they're planting churches. They're building churches and then they're leaving the independent churches with elders so that they can go out there and preach the word of God, right? Paul's not doing everything. He's not the pastor of all the churches. He's not running the conference or the, or the, or the uh, religion, you know, like the Catholics have the Pope. And if you go, you follow the Seventh-day Adventists, even though they, uh, they say they're independent. They all have to answer to like a conference. And that conference decides how all the money is distributed to all the churches. And they actually hire all the pastors. Can you imagine that? That's, a, that's dumb. But anyways, that's a whole other... I'm not going to get into it. But another thing that stands out here, and this has nothing to do with the message uh, specifically. But think about just how great Paul was. It says there in verse 19, it says, And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people. And having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he So they take Paul... And they leave him for dead. It says, How be it as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and he came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. In other words, Paul didn't mope around, woe is me, because they just stoned him. I mean, think about it. I mean, you get the flu nowadays, and you're out for a couple of days. I mean, I, all, you know, I still run a business, and one of the things that annoys me the most when people call in, and they're like, oh, well, you know, I just, my head hurts. So I'm just going to miss a couple of days of work. You know, can you imagine Paul? Hey, God, I don't have time to go out there and preach the gospel because they just stole me. I think he would actually have had a valid excuse. I mean, they left him for dead. Think about that. That's a serious, I mean, so he was unconscious long enough for these guys to think this guy's dead. And then he gets up the next day and goes back to work. I mean, have you ever gotten injured and then just try to go back the next day to work? You know, whether you just hurt your ankle or you, you have a headache or you're sick. It's tough work. And yet, that's how committed he was to the Lord. And when you're building the foundation on Christ, you're willing to go above and beyond what is asked of you to get the job done. Anyway, that, I just, that really stood out to me. Go just to one page over to Acts 13. Actually, you can, if your Bible it depends on where you are, but you just stay there. It's Acts 13, verse 45 through 49. And so we're, we're God's children. We're soul winning. So we're getting spiritual children, we're discipling, we're planting churches, and then we're doing the missionary work, right? We're going out to the ends of the world. It says in uh, Acts 13, verse 45, it says, When the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blasphemy. And that's so common about church, right? Anytime somebody comes and does a good work, if you're not sold out for the Lord, they're jealous, and they're contradicting, and they're blasphemy. And uh, let's go to verse 46. And it says, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you 
but seeing ye put uh, put it from you that, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for a salvation unto the end of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. So God doesn't just want us to go out soul winning here locally. He wants us to build up people and plant churches and then go out there and create missionaries or mission work. I don't know if, if I, I don't think you necessarily have to be a missionary to do mission work. I think we're all missionaries in the work of the Lord. I mean, you can go out soul winning anywhere in the world. As a matter of fact, I travel a lot. And anytime I preach the word, I guess that's mission work, right? Because yeah. it's outside of my region. I don't always lead souls to Christ here in Houston, Texas, right here in the 77043 zip code. Sometimes it's outside of the zip code, so that's missionary work. So what the Bible's telling us is, look, this is the foundation you want to build. God's not uh, going to contradict himself, so let's go back to Psalm 127. Let's close this out. But before we do that, I don't want to miss this point. Look, guys, it's coming. We have to be careful to preach the word. I mean, we have to be vigilant, and we have to be bold, and we have to be strong in the word. And it's not only so that we lead souls to Christ. We're going to lead them, but also to protect those that we've already led to Christ. This is just recent. This, uh, this is July 26, 2018. And uh, uh, this is Metro Weekly. I don't know what Metro Weekly is. But uh, TEDx, have you guys ever heard of TED? these uh, supposed motivational speakers and they get up and say all kinds of stupid stuff because if you listen to them it's all stupid yeah. but this one speaker got up there and she argues that pedophilia should be accepted as an unchangeable sexual orientation you know I've been look, following this, this trend for a while about this pedophilia and every time you, I look, you look it up it's supposedly debunked no this is not real pedophiles aren't trying to get accepted in society well, that's always the first step. It's this contradicting argument, right? It's the straw man. They create the argument on both sides of the spectrum. The guys who are against and the guys who are, are for. And then they play this game of cat and mouse with your mind where, yes, it's happening. No, it's not. Yes, it's happening. No, it's not. What it's meant to do is to lower your guard so that you don't think about it anymore. You, you, it just passes by. Think about how easily, for example, we just accepted the TSA after September 11th. And slowly but surely, you go through the check line or the checklist, right, or you'll pay money so you don't have to take off your belt and your shoes and get through the x-ray. Nobody argues that point anymore. People are getting groped up and down all over the place and, you know, it, it's just a matter of fact. When in reality, we shouldn't even have to do that. I mean, that's not gonna avoid terrorism in this world or in this country. Terrorism still exists. It didn't put a stop to anything. Yep. But that's not, that's the, but the point here I'm making is, you know, in January and February when I was looking this stuff up, it was like, oh no, that's not real, that's not true, they're not trying to add this stuff, they're not trying to be pedosexuals. Um, this is just a couple of days ago, as a matter of fact, it was, uh, Friday was my daughter's birthday, 27, so this was Thursday, this lady got up there just a couple of days ago, and it was like, look, pedophiles, they're born like that. She's like, the bad part is not that they're born like this, we need to be supportive of them, the bad part is when they act on it. This is what she's saying now. This is somebody who's revered. You know, people that go to TED, these, this TED program or this TED movement, they're, they're revered and people listen to them and then this becomes like the norm, the trend, what's accepted in society in these circles. So we have to be careful because this is what's coming next. How frustrating is it gonna be for us? When we're gonna have, how are we gonna stand against this? We're gonna have to, this is gonna get serious. Because there's a difference between fight, fighting sodomy, these adults that are doing whatever they want to. What are you gonna do when they're trying to tell you that it's normal for some guy or girl to come near your children and touch them unseemly or do all kinds of things? It's gonna get, you know what I mean? I'm not, what I'm trying to say is we're gonna have a battle on our hands that's bigger than anything we've ever imagined. But the Bible tells us that. But that's okay, because the Bible says, look, it didn't matter. The foundation is the Lord. So let's close out with this. You know, let's just read, just look at uh, Psalm 127 again. Say, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that built it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wa waketh in vain. So see, how do we keep the city? We found ourselves in the Lord. See, God's going to protect us and separate us from this 
If we have watchmen that are founded in the Lord, if you have a watchman who's in vain, you know, a guy could fall asleep and then you get attacked. You know, you ever hear of the Trojan horse? You know, that one, somebody wasn't paying attention and they let this thing in and then everybody got, the, the city got sacked, but that's a whole other, I'm not going to, let's not get into that. Let's go to verse 2. It says, It is vain for you to rise up early to sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. It says, Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord. In other words, they're an inheritance. They're our reward. It says, And the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. We need to grow churches. We need to grow our families because it makes us mighty in the Lord. Happy is the man that had this quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies of the gate. So we will be able to combat the enemy if we do what the Lord has asked us to do. And so, so I don't know how the Lord lays these things. I'm not going to, you know, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of Bible verses to back that up. It's not the sermon. But God laid this Psalm 127 on me. And I think it's because we're seeing this trend where the attack on children is becoming more prevalent. It wasn't like that before. And what's interesting is if we don't control the narrative, they're going to change it on us. Because there are groups out there, just like I just got up here and said pedophilia and sodomy and homosexuality is uh, abuse on children. If you have children, there's groups out there that turn the narrative and say, look, when you're preaching God's word, that's child abuse. And we know that's not the case. As a matter of fact, meet anybody who's saved by grace through Jesus Christ and is uh, working for the Lord. And they're probably some of the most stable people you're ever going to meet in your life. As a matter of fact, you can probably go to toe-to-toe -to -toe in a debate with them. And then two minutes later, you guys can go have like an ice cream sundae and have a great day. Talk to somebody who hates the Lord and see if they don't try to destroy your entire life. Yep. See if they don't try to throw you in jail and try to take away your kids. Try to do all this kind of evil wickedness. So let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your wonderful blessings, Lord. More importantly, Lord, thanks for this message that you laid on us. But Lord, help us to grow and to put our foundations and our fundamentals in you, Lord. It's your word that stands the test of time. It's your word that doesn't change. And your word tells us that children are heritage, they're our reward, but also that it's our responsibility to train them up in the way that they should go. It's our responsibility to educate them and teach them and admonish them in the fear of the Lord. So Lord, give us that strength, give us that wisdom, give us that knowledge to do so every day. And when we're out there winning souls, help us to not only win them over, Lord, but then disciple them afterwards and raise them up and train them in the way of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.